Hello and welcome to the next edition of Lights in Europe. Today, at the occasion of World Cancer Day, we speak to Catherine Pollet, who's a nutrition health coach, and sharing with us the tips and tricks on how to navigate the space of all kinds of wisdom and advice that we receive on managing our vitality, our energy, and basically working on our health and feeling well in our bodies and minds. Her mom, as the first yoga teacher in Brussels, taught her many of these practices, but over time she understood that there's more to it. So listen to her sharing why and how our primary food is not food, how to find the right balance between feeling guilty about doing our yoga or whatever practice in the morning and not sleeping enough, and how to be the change in the families and how to basically bring the practices and a bit of new lifestyle advice to the partners and kids in our home. Hi, Catherine. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Lucia. Your mom was the first yoga teacher in Brussels, uh, but died of stress-induced cancer, as you yes. told me. And uh, we're, mov- we're meeting at the occasion of the World Cancer Day on 2nd of February. And so I was wondering if you could share a little bit how you feel about the origins of your journey, because you could have given up on all the self-care practices that you've learned that your mom taught you at home. and and because of the tragedy that happened in your family, you could have given up, but in the end you became a holistic kind of coach. So how does this story unfold for you? So the the very beginnings were my mom, obviously she was a yoga teacher. So I started this kind of, uh, when I was still in her belly, as I used to say. You were already doing yoga. Yeah, she she took me everywhere uh, from an age of two, three, four years old. uh, She brought me to the yoga classes she gave so she was the first yoga teacher in the commission the first uh, woman yoga teacher in Brussels because at that time in the 60s, 70s it was mainly uh, men giving uh, yoga also in India it was uh, formerly more only for men and not for women to teach and so I kind of grew up in this and it must have been very natural for you well for her she must have felt as a pioneer in a sense (laughs) Yes, kind of. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I grew up naturally in in the healthy side, not necessarily uh, coaching at that point, but uh, healthy food, nutrition, yoga, so this kind of holistic approach of uh, self-care and well-being. And so it's interesting that as a European baby, in a sense, if you say that as a little child you were already going to Berlamo, which is one of the main buildings of the European Commission here in Brussels, you were surrounded by the European system, the institutions and the self-care practices and you ended up being a European official, a fonctionnaire at the, yes. at the European Commission. So you have your normal EU job, which is very head-based, very analytical. And at the same time, you developed a coaching and and nutrition-based coaching practice. So show us a little bit how this how this thinking arises in a in a professional who tries to align these two parts of the personality, because we see many people um, who kind of discover these kind of practices as they are in their corporate careers and then leave their careers in order to dedicate their lives to Mm -hmm. bringing this gift to the people around them. But for you, it was part of your life, but still you ended up being in the administration at the same time. So is this like two parts of your personality or how does it really come together? I think it's really rare nowadays to find uh, people who are really working at something which they feel like their purpose unless you look at uh, creatives or artists and so on. I have a lot of things I like, which I can't do at my work. So the coaching side is more the fulfilling part, outside work. So I'm not really a workaholic, uh, or I would never be a workaholic in the administration, because I have too many things I'm interested in. I'm also a creative. And so it was the opportunity to mix all the things I, I'm interested in and I like. And this is how I came to the coaching. I, was, I wanted first to study nutrition, but uh, again, this, it's too, it has a, a too medical approach, uh, not taking into account uh, body, mind and soul as we, we used to know it. And so this is how I came across uh, IIN, which is the Institute for Integrative Nutrition in New York, where I studied uh, nutrition and health coaching. 
And also people always came to me asking me uh, for advice. I don't know why, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's, uh, I don't know how, how because I, I never spoke about this, uh, especially around me. Because, because you're radiating the health and the vitality, so when people see, they just maybe. come and ask for recipes, how do you make it happen? Yeah, and so the this was kind of the, the beginnings of my coaching uh, the feeling that this is really where I can make an impact and help people. And so tell us what is the health nutrition coaching because it's not about nutrition as primarily I thought so as well. I thought that you were working on health plans with people, teaching them how to eat healthy and lose weight and basically align their energy thanks mm -hmm. to nutrition. Yes. But you said it's, it's not that, so <laughs> tell so, us your, your theory of our theory or, or the, the scope of what you're actually doing. So uh, what I always say, the primary food, it's not the food you eat, uh, it's uh, the relationships you have, the work, exercise and self-care. So you can eat as healthy as you want. If you have stress in your relationships, if you have stress at work, it will have an impact on your health and it will also have an impact or can have an impact on your weight. So addressing only the nutrition part won't, won't be enough. So you can follow a, a diet, a specific diet for months uh, or a certain time and it will work. And then you stop and you go back to old habits. And this is where you go back and gain back the weight and even more weight you lost. So what is your recipe for winning this intention to transform people's lives? Because it can become, I guess, very overwhelming when somebody comes to you and says, I don't feel well in my body, stuff is not really working, I don't sleep well, the relationships aren't right. I guess everybody's got a series of points that they want to work on in their lives and it can yes. be difficult to know where to start from because there's so much advice around us and some of it can be valuable, some of it can be all kinds of tips and tricks which then don't necessarily need to work because you need personalized advice anyway. So how do you advise them where to start from? Well, the first session is a little bit uh, taking stuff of their life, what is going on, uh, if they have a lot of stress at work, if they don't have enough time, if they don't sleep enough, how they eat. So it's really having a clear picture of their life. And uh, it often seems a little bit strange for my clients, uh, they say it after a while, so uh, telling me I really didn't know uh, where we were going in the beginning, but it's so amazing to see the results. So it's really putting into place certain things, little by little, not too much at a time, because this sounds like uh, New Year's re resolutions where you want to diet, start exercise, sleep more and whatever, and it lasts one week. So it's really about putting into place little changes over the time and this is where you have the big effect. Give us examples of the little changes that little each of us can do tonight. <laughs> little changes uh, start by breathing. It sounds so so easy, so obvious and, and, and so strange sometimes for people, but we don't breathe, we don't take the time to breathe. And breathe well. So deep breathing, just one, two deep breath from time to time allows your body to remember that you need to breathe uh, profoundly and not just like in a stress situation you just have the minimum of air you to survive okay what else drink enough water how much it depends on how you eat <laughs> if you eat uh, a lot of fruits and vegetables you probably don't have a lot of weight problems but you could also have but really one and a half to two liters of water or infusions coffee doesn't count we repeat, coffee doesn't count for coffee all does. my friends binging on coffee five, <laughs> five times a day. So an easy tip is uh, you drink a, glass, uh, a cup of coffee, drink a glass of water because mm -hmm. coffee is dehydrating as alcohol. So there is nothing against a glass of wine, but don't forget the water. And so when we are speaking food, when we met, we had fish and fries. I started feeling guilty immediately and you were sharing about how to basically work your mind and appreciate basically what was the food that you're serving your body, even if it's junk food. So talk to us a little bit about how you find that balance. How do you clean your diet and how do you make it balanced and, and nourishing while not torturing yourself with 
all that we shouldn't be eating and sometimes we are craving it. Yeah, so I get, I get a lot of times the, these reactions from people when they see me uh, with some sweet or something I shouldn't and they say, yeah, but uh, you're a nutrition health coach. And I say, yeah, and one of the rules is the 90-10 rule. So the 90-10. So if 90% of the time you eat well and healthy, 10% of the time you can indulge. And then you really should indulge without guilt because this would stress yourself again. So if you have uh, fries, that's okay. Don't have fries seven days a week, for example. This is similar to the daily routines when we were discussing that many of us are trying to incorporate sports into our busy daily lives as we like to think about them. And so sometimes I would myself or discussing with my friends try to understand how to find the right balance between having a daily sports practice, for instance, in early morning and also getting enough sleep. And it's difficult to, you know, because you have all these gurus who tell you you need to sleep enough or you have other people and all the top management CEO books would tell you how the CEOs wake up at 4 a.m. in order to read and do their workout etc so you end up thinking that you can compensate for sleep with your magical morning so again how do you figure out what's the best way for you to manage your daily routines without then being either tired or feeling guilty about doing something more or less I think uh, we're living in a world uh, which is about uh, doing the most. Sleep is not so much valued, which is really wrong. I think we should all have around uh, seven to eight hours of sleep. If you have a look at Ariane Huffington, yes, uh, sh- she was sleeping for four or five hours a night uh, until she had a, a problem. And since then, she's the first advocate to say to everyone, sleep enough, sleep enough. It's really important. And you can't recuperate. So you can't say during the week, I sleep only for four, five, six hours. And you, uh, during the weekends, I sleep 10 to 12 hours. The sleep is lost. So you never get it back. And I think it's really about not putting too much pressure on ourselves, listening to our body. If you're tired, go to bed. In your coaching practice, how do you work with your clients to push them a little bit further and reach the objectives that they set out for themselves? Because what you're saying can sound as staying in our comfort zone is okay because we have to be gentle with our bodies. So how do you find the right balance again between self-love and then working towards whatever objective you give yourself? So this is also part of the coaching. Uh, I mean, if I give you now all the things you have to do you will say great I know it it's like reading a book and not taking action but when you have someone you see every two weeks it's like an accountability partner so you're more aware of what you should do you think more about it and my program is uh, three months if you have a weekly session six months if you have a session every two weeks but this uh, allows you to implement to develop the habits and then exactly. slowly feel as they have already always been part of your life in a sense? Yes, totally. So I had a client who didn't slept enough and I, I t- uh, drank too much coffee, which also uh, has an impact on how you sleep, obviously, if you do drink coffee until late in the evening. And uh, now she says, she says yeah, uh, if I'm tired, I'm, I'm going to bed earlier and that's fine. How can you, uh, your, you and your clients, to which degree do you work with the families that are surrounding them? Because it's all very nice that you are the accountability partner of your clients, but then they go home and they have, let's say, kids to take care of, or they have their partners who continue living their old lifestyle and either going uh, late to bed or wanting their good old junk dinner. So do you, in a sense, always intend to work with the families at the same time or do you give them tools how to bring that change into their surrounding? Uh, sometimes uh, I work with the family, but uh, mostly the fact that it's mostly women, but you have also men, but mostly women, they make, if, if it's not a change from one day to the other, it, these are little changes they do uh, every day, it kind of changes the routine at home as well. And it's not too radical, I exactly. guess. Exactly. And it's also so. easier for the family to adapt and, and to make these little changes. How is it in your family? You are a very European in a sense. I have uh, three daughters. Uh, the first was born in Brussels, the second in France, the third in Spain. 
and now I have uh, one living in Vienna and two in Spain studying and so it's a uh, yeah it's really shows the European way of living I mean my parents my mother was German my father Belgian uh, I was born in Brussels and I, I lived in, in Spain 15 years, I lived in France, I lived in Luxembourg, so I moved around a lot as well. I guess it's helpful that you've known all these cultures also in your practice because yes. the clients that you work with come from all corners of Europe mm -hmm. as we are the, the Babylon Tower here and each of us comes with different baggage and, and practices and traditions in yes. terms of our daily routines and, and um, nutrition habits as well. So. It's probably helpful to understand a little bit where, where the untouchables are. I, I was having lunch with an Italian friend of mine yesterday and we had a very deep conversation about the pizza religion in Italy and how you're not supposed to be touching that disregarding of uh, whatever kind of diet you're trying to implement. So are there untouchables in people's diets? Yes, but I think, uh, you know, you have to know from where people come. So. Um, I have habits uh, from the, my mother or when I lived in Germany as well, uh, when you are a child and then when you grow up you say, oh this was so good, I remember that. And then you, you take over some habits, uh, I took over from Spain for example. And it's just uh, incorpor incorporating it, but also there is no one diet that fits everyone. Uh, what is good for me, for example, may, maybe is not is not good for you. So you have to give the people or or leave the the, the people what they know from as since they were kids, because you can have uh, in in Brussels in Belgium, for example, you have a lot of Italian or Belgian with Italian origin. So you can't tell them don't eat pizza anymore or don't eat pasta. This is something they grew up with, uh, their parents, grandparents. So it's a diet which comes over generations. So you can't change everything. And this is why diet plans, uh, I'm really against that. Um, a lot of people come to me and ask, uh, think, okay, they will receive a diet, follow it and lose weight. But for this, I think they are better off uh, going to a nutritionist. But it's only, uh, they are only addressing the weight problem, but not really uh, their health. At the same time, you're also an Ayurvedic practitioner, so I was wondering how this marries with the Ayurvedic principles, which can be very strict on certain types of profiles who are not supposed to be eating certain types of foods because it's yeah. not what your body type is craving and made for. So it depends a little bit on the client because some clients are open to it and then uh, we'll, we check to see which type they are and then they try it. And uh, some are more rational and find it a little bit strange and so we we find we try to find a, another approach but i have a client for example she she totally changed with the ayurveda and since then she's feeling good so uh, it was a win win ayurveda is a magic one of your other principles or practices that you're working with is called autogenic training. Yes. What is it? So autogenic training is a relaxation technique, uh, which I learned when I was 13, with my mom, obviously. <laughs> and it's based on autosuggestion. So you really have to learn it well uh, to say the things in a certain way, because you always it has an impact on your uh, respiration. On your Is it breathing. like mantras? No, it's auto-suggestion. So it's really uh, telling your body that it feels warm, that it feels heavy, so you really go into deep relaxation. Uh, so in the beginning you need a little kind of uh, 20 to 30 minutes per session to, to learn it and once you can do it, it functions in two minutes. So it's really uh, once you learn the autogenic training, uh, and you, you can do it on your own, in two minutes you can be totally relaxed. And this is only the first level because then you have another level where you can also uh, include like, you could call it mantra or like specific affirmations. People used it to stop smoking, uh, I used it to get rid of migraines for example, so it has a, a wide approach. What do you say to people who tell you it's impossible to get rid of their migraines? 
I did it. I have a family history of migraines. My mother had migraines. Uh, I had it as well. And I remember one day I, I had no uh, medication around me. It was on a Saturday evening or Sunday evening. And for those who have them from time to time, they know you just really want to cut off your head because it's so heavy. And in it was getting worse and worse, and younger and younger people are getting them. Yes, but I think so. This I had, guess there it must be correlated also with the rise of stress and unhealthy food, probably. Pro yes. And as you're saying, the other pillars of health that you were mentioning: not enough yes. sleep, not good enough sleep, not enough water, etc. Is yes. it true? Yes. It has an impact. So you have a lot of triggers which can be different from one person to another. Not enough sleep, stress, uh, dehydration. So if you don't drink enough water, um, yeah, the, sometimes some certain foods can have a, an impact also, but this depends from one person to another. Uh, a hormonal imbalance. So it's really uh, wide range. Is there any element of all these uh, holistic healing practices that you feel have not been explored enough yet, that they are going to come about in the future, in the coming years, and it will be the next big thing that we will all be studying and trying to incorporate into our practices? I would say it's more back to basics. We know all the basics, we know uh, it's so easy. And we don't take it. Uh, we don't take it into account because we are so surrounded with the media. Uh, it's easier to take a pill in 20 minutes after you feel well. But you just. Uh, it's just. It just has an impact on the symptom, but not on the cause. So if you have a headache, you take something for your headache. 20 minutes later, you find uh, you feel well, but you don't know why you have a headache. So you don't cure, you you don't uh, find the solution for the cause. You don't cure the cause. And so now coming back to the World Cancer Day, yes. since there is a bit more conversation about how to prevent cancer, if you say come back to the basics, I, I guess it may sound extremely simplifying. But are there what are the three top practices you would like to recommend people in their in their self care? in order to minimize the probability that this kind of thing would happen to them. So I would, we've said stress, water, sleep. Yes, uh, moving a little bit more. We're always taking the car even for 10 minutes when we could perfectly move. I know that this is kind of shifting now more and more, so this is a good thing. Uh, eating healthy, uh, no processed food because it's so easy to go and buy something. You put it in the, in, in the microwave and five or ten minutes later you can eat. But it doesn't take much longer to prepare yourself your meal and at least you know what, it is, what is inside. Because there are so many ingredients we can't even pronounce in what we buy. So uh, if it can be organic, better. But even if it's not organic, but if you, have, you buy food which is not with a code bar, where we don't understand what's yeah. written on the etiquette, not by it. Exactly, yeah. exactly.